Um, Mark, you want me to take it away? I'll, uh, I mean, and we can both jump in on this. Does that sound good to you? Yeah. Oh. So. Yeah. Why don't you do you start out because uh, you uh, you have the you did the slides and uh, so yep. you uh, you got the train. You got it. All right. Fantastic. Um, for everyone on the call today, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate your time. Um, I I will tell you that this is going to become a running document. Um, things that I have done, uh, that Mark and I have done, we've put the, um, the act in the back of the document so that if we do need to refer to them, we can um, at all times. So we'll continue to add to this document and possibly take away from this document each week. But um, I'll start by just a quick reminder um, of who is on each, on the committee from the advisory, I mean, sorry, the, who is on the committee um, from the Vermont side, Tim Wessel, um, Dr. Mark Levine, and of course, Ingrid Jonas, who's with us today. And uh, then Mark Gorman, myself, and uh, Gina Cranwinkle are here. And also, I believe we have Megan um, Howe, who is assisting in taking notes. A quick reminder to everyone, our milestone is October 20th, and that is when we will have to put forth our recommendations solidly packaged up, no pun intended, for the board um, for their use. And so that is one of our, our um, initiatives. Because this is being recorded and also as a reminder to the general public, if you would like to make public comments, you can do so by visiting um, ccv vermont.gov and there is a place for you to input public comments there were no written comments sent in this week so i will move on from there as another um, reminder of what we discussed last week is that we would be looking at this in phases with rules and guidelines and packaging and labeling and then also with edibles and um, department of health oversight i will say as mark and i continue to work through all of the information, it's, look, it's really looking more like phase one and phase two are melding into phase one because there's so much overlap in there and um, that'll become more clear as um, we talk about some additional initiatives here. So for, for you, Ingrid, um, yesterday we shared some information um, from different states on what they're doing in terms of warnings and guidelines and how they have enacted their own um, their own initiatives. So one of the things that Mark and I have seen consistently as commonalities in the warnings that are put forth by um, anyone's cannabis control board commission, however they choose to name it, is um, we're seeing consistency in impairment where they're asking you not to operate machinery or drive that cannabis may be habit forming, that it's not safe for kids, for use by adults 21 and over, and also should not be used by pregnant or breastfeeding women. Um, we also noted um, different states were using different verbiage, but we continuously saw uh, things like delayed impairment, especially when it comes to edibles, that it could be, your, it could be delayed by two hours or more. We are consistently, um, actually not as consistently seeing accidental ingestion and the poison control number um, out, not safe for pets, that um, mm -hmm. there is limited information on health risk. We've seen that. Um, edibles can't be associated with cartoons, toys, designs, colors, or shapes that appeal to children. Um, one thing I will share, and while this is Canadian, one of the items that I saw this week was a retailer who had used um, um, in Canada, a strawberry as part of his logo. And it was nice and bright um, looking. And so there were a lot of parent complaints because it was inside of a hockey rink. So um, I would say that's something we'll address in further detail soon on the CCB's requirements for the design of your logo and ensuring that um, it isn't a, um, a child friendly type of product. Um, all, and, and of course, I just covered logos brands not associated with cartoons, toys, designs, colors, or shapes that appeal to children. And then also, we're starting to see more on psychoactives um, and synthetics, Delta 8, Delta 9. Um, and then, of course, Dr. Levine provided um, some information from the CDC, which I'm starting to see some pickups in the trade press. Um, Ingrid, any questions about those right now, just the commonalities and other things we've seen or anything you think not we right might have now. missed? Okay, fantastic. Thank you. And then um, because Massachusetts is still so new, 
and this is an ever-evolving industry, I will say that they have uh, one of the most comprehensive sets of guidelines out there for um, their own um, licensees to follow, and it's very clear and very concise. So um, I did put Massachusetts in this particular slide deck because it is so easy to understand and very direct in what they want. Um, they use the statement, please consume responsibly. Right? They require that, but then they also have five additional statements of which if someone is advertising their products, um, you have to use two additional of these. Um, it's just an interesting phenomenon. They do talk about um, impairment and habit forming. They talk about concentration, coordination, judgment, and of course, don't operate um, machinery under the influence. Um, health risks could be associated 21 and older, and of course, not to be used by women who are pregnant or are breastfeeding. Beyond that, one of the things that they do have is a standard warning that talks about some things that have been noted um, by the subcommittee in um, previous meetings. It's not been analyzed by the FDA, limited information on side effects, again, pregnancy, breastfeeding, um, against the law to drive or operate, keep away from children, very bold, um, again, health risk, impair concentration, coordinated and judgment, and the impairment of edibles may be delayed by two hours or more, then they include the poison control hotline or call 911, and um, I, I think that they have a nice subtlety with something that was brought up um, on a previous meeting as well, that this may be illegal outside of the state of Massachusetts. Mark, you want to, or Ingrid, anybody want to add anything on this or thoughts or comments? I just, uh, Tanika, I was going to raise a question about whether sure. anybody uh, has a, uh, a quarrel with any of these. Yeah, I think that's a fan. That have been made on the last two slides because. You know, in, in dealing with people who I thought should have been knowledgeable about cannabis uh, over the past two or three years, before my time at NACB, you could get, and you still can get, big pushback when you mention intoxication, when you mention uh, Im impaired driving. I mean, they're just people who refuse to believe it, and I, but I haven't heard anything. Uh, from from any of our subcommittee members or even any of the others that we've we've talked to in the Vermont during the Vermont project. Yeah, Ingrid, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, you know, I tend to err on the side of giving people as many facts as possible so they can make educated choices. So I feel very concerned about you know things like impairment and people being made aware of the habit forming. I'm sure that's probably debatable. I don't, I mean, I'm sure there are people that would debate that. I certainly don't, right. haven't studied research on that, but um, also the delayed um, onset, so to speak, of edible cannabis, I think is really, you know, those kinds of things are, I think, important. And I thought it was interesting that Massachusetts had the requirements that they need to have two of those different warnings at least mm -hmm. if not more so, like how do you pick between warnings about you know pregnant people and children and impairment and agree so, i don't know i'm not an advertising I, I don't have the foggiest idea about advertising and i'm not looking to shut progress down but i do think that as much information as possible for people going into this is very uh, important. Agreed. I, and I, one of the things I see between these two slides, the, the please consume responsibly and then the other slide is that um, the, and I can't 100% say this, but it seems to follow also along with what um, would be required of the safety flyer that we referenced um, that would be need to be done for point of sale. So it's very similar to that. And matter of fact, I'm going to flip straight to that so we can take a look at it and then we'll talk a, a little bit more about that. So a retailer shall display safety information, a safety information flyer at point of purchase and offer a customer a copy of the flyer with each purchase. Um, in it, it talks about, um, I, I, and I've got, I'm looking a little bit closer, flyers uh, developed by the board, but I think there's just, um, and then people can take that 
um, and download it free of charge, contain information concerning the methods of administering cannabis, amount of time it may take for cannabis product to take effect, the risks of driving under the influence, potential health risks, symptoms of problematic usage, how to receive help, and a warning that cannabis is illegal under federal law. So going back to Massachusetts in here, many of those are right here contained in these statements and then also in this area. And um, I, I think that in, in keeping in the spirit of what Tim Wessel said on one of our meetings that it was very, it was jarring um, to see that this is federally illegal. I do believe that Massachusetts has done a nice job from a communications perspective of saying it may be illegal outside of Massachusetts. Um, it, it, it's a nice twist uh, turn on um, federally illegal that um, that does, you know, share that initiative. So I think that's important to note. And anything else, Ingrid, you want to add? Um, I think it's still processing. Yeah, okay. But not Fine. Thank you, though. I, I guess one of my questions I would have for you as well is, is this is the information that we're presenting now and putting forth, is this um, giving you more of what you need um, when we do come back for a quorum to start making, you know, more informed yeah. decisions? Excellent. Yeah. Great. That's yeah, what I, I think. Yeah, that, that comprehensive flyer, that was a good reminder that that's part of what is required. And I think that's important. Excellent. Yeah. So yeah. The, the last thing on Massachusetts that I think um, as, as an advertiser, marketer, someone that's done this for so long that I really appreciate is that they even come in and say what font size you need to use, which is um, I think incredibly important. They don't want, it's gotta be at least 10 points. And then they, they clearly state the fonts they want you to use, Times New Roman, Helvetica, or Arial. To put this in perspective, this entire deck is done in Arial. So this is so that it's easier to read and it's clear. I use Arial a lot um, in, in most of my stuff because it's a very easy font on the eyes. And so they make you say in 10 point, at a, at a minimum of 10 points, keep out of reach of children. And then if a product contains multiple servings, which is where things like the edibles may come into play here, um, they also require that you put in 10 point font, um, same same font times Helvetica or Arial includes multiple servings. So I do believe that there is um, a very comprehensive and well thought out guideline that um, may offer some adaptation and adoption to what Vermont would like to do um, to educate their public. Any questions before I move on? Um, I just have a, sure. a little embarrassed to ask a question, but just in terms of servings, I think that keeps coming up for me, like helping guide people around, like what is their responsible amount right. of serving? And when, can we talk a little bit more about that? Like um, in terms of that warning label example that you gave through email, mm -hmm. I think last week, that was for, something that's edible, correct? Or was that like, I don't know. How do we I, talk about serving or dose when it comes to the different like edible versus smokable versus that sort of thing? You know, I think that is an excellent discussion and one that uh, I would certainly welcome Gina or someone else's comment on because I, I would like to be prepared for that discussion. Um, if that's okay, it, that we do that possibly as a takeaway for our next meeting to talk about serving. Yeah, yeah. I just want to put that. No, on the table I, because... I think that's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, I think unfortunately what we're finding is that still there is no uh, general consensus on what a serving is or what impairment is. Or how many servings you know, you would want to sell at one time. Or, or, and so I think that is something, I'll certainly let Gina chime in, but what I'd like for Mark and I to be able to do um, for the subcommittee and everyone here is to uh, go back and get that information and we can have a, a, a more informed discussion. But Gina, would you like to chime in? Yeah, Ingrid, um, last week we did 
show you a label for an edible. And obviously that will differ and change if someone is, you know, taking it as a concentrate or um, smoking the flower. But once again, as people said, you know, a dose for one, a serving size for one person will vary from each person and how um, they process it. And even the same person, depending on the food that they had um, that day will also impact um, how they respond to even one serving size. So we can provide some more information for the subcommittee next week about this. Yeah, I think the best we're gonna find a Correct me if you think I'm wrong, Gina. Is a you know is, is a consensus among the states uh, who have who have regulated already, and uh, they're not all the same. But you know there's there there is some consensus anyway. There's maybe there's safety in numbers. Yeah, there's a lot of more consensus around the what they would want in a serving size. So the max serving size that a product can have in it. Um, or how much a container can have overall. So, but we can provide more information, I think next week, just to really get more understanding of what average serving sizes are in some different states, especially on the East Coast uh, and or what they would write as max. We'll be prepared for that. Is there any other information that you would like around that specific topic so we can bring it um, to the subcommittee next week. Um, for me, I think, no, I just, I think it's just a big question in my mind. It's like, how are people best informed around, Got it. you know, are responsible, like what guidance do they have around responsible um, servings or dosing, so to speak? I know that there have been talks maybe in medicinal cannabis of creating educational brochures or a short educational video um, for people at a dispensary. Um, so that might be something that they look into just to give them some information. Okay. Yep. Excellent. Thank you so much, Gina. I appreciate you stepping in. So, um, Ingrid, we have those as takeaways. We'll note them and we'll get um, some discussions on the table with that. But I, um, as I move on to the next piece, one of the things we talked about on our last meeting was giving, um, giving you something to react to in terms of what um, a warning might look like or a, you know, a universal type of warning. And so, um, Mark and I had the opportunity to correspond with a gentleman by the name of Dr. David Nathan, who wrote an article um, on packaging and labeling for um, cannabis science and technology in the July, August of 2020 edition. So um, we reached out to him and asked him um, some information about that. And the interesting thing, he had a conversation with us about the evolution of what is going on with um, um, international packaging labeling standards. And so um, I was uh, shocked and thankful that he and his, um, his son, Eli, who is also a graphic designer, they've developed these together, put together some symbols for us to see. And so we've brought those up here. He, um, they designed them for Vermont to take a look at. And so one of the things that I think is incredibly important about what they're doing um, in their standard work is the symbol development that they're doing. They follow ISO 3864, which is the International Standards Organization. They actually have standards for safety signs. And so um, what is so great about it when I read up a little more on ISO 3864 is it's truly about safety. And so there's some interesting critiques which we can share um, with you later on other states and how um, the use of color, the use of some of their items are more of a stop um, versus a warning. And so um, 
we wanted to share these with you today. This is what a potential could look like for Vermont that would follow um, some already well-documented international, um, international and American standards, because it's not just ISO, there's ANSI, which is the American National Standards Institute, which is part of ISO. Um, so he put this forth. And so again, you know, love your thoughts on it. I know no decisions can be made, but to see what you think, but for our next meeting, my hope is that we can compare this to other states in one slide. Okay. Excellent. Mark, do you want to add anything yeah. on this? I was just going to ask, uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot. You're probably the first time you've seen uh, some of these, uh, Ingrid, but does any, any of these uh, stand out to you as you know most appropriate for the, uh, the warning signs um, mean for cannabis uh, packages and advertisements? I might be missing, so I can only see the Massachusetts guidelines. Uh, oh, weird. Talking about the um, font size and style. So I saw it for a second earlier. I don't know if I, I'm just on my I, phone. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. I, I came off it and went back to it, but I can also share this with you, um, share this yeah. deck with you. Do you see it now, by chance? There may be a slight delay on your phone with the video. Why not? Uh, I'm still at the. Oh, there it is. Got it. Okay. Right. Yeah. Great. Uh, let's see. So you're asking me my sort of initial thoughts on these. Um, Um, you know, it may also, Ingrid, not to put you on the spot, it may help if we could drop this on a fake package for next week so that you could see what it looks like in that context as well. Great. Um, and we'd like to compare them with other state symbols um, in our Monday meeting. Does the Vermont either spelled out or the abbreviation indicate that what does that indicate that it's being sold in Vermont or grown in Vermont or what is that? Yes, basically sold in Vermont and it would be something that could be used on all of your packaging, your advertising. It would be Vermont symbol, warning symbol for cannabis. Right. And again, we can provide some additional rationale um, and a comparison yeah. on Monday. Yeah. I mean, I feel like the use of the word THC and the, the lease is important. I feel, you know, if it has to have a Vermont thing in it, I feel like number four is a little bit like glorifying <clears throat> the sort of, I don't know, it's sort of like That's having fair. sort of element to my initial eye that's like, aren't we great? We have this. I don't know. I feel, so I feel like a more neutral kind of informative okay. as opposed to like, but that's just me. And um, well, so. your your perspective is incredibly valued and valid, um, especially okay. with um, you know your service in law enforcement to give some of that perspective. So I always love gut reactions um, mm -hmm. because it definitely does help to put things there. So what I'd like to do um, for our next meeting is compare these to some other states and see if we could drop something, like I said, on a faux package that you could at least take a look at. Um, I was very pleased that um, the team um, was, was so willing to very quickly put something together for us that is in line with those um, standards. And that article that I referenced, again, it's um, Cannabis Science and Technology. While there's a lot of stuff in the article, um, and it is kind of long, the um, uh, David Nathan did tell uh, Mark and I yesterday that there have been a lot of refinements and uh, um, updates made, which is something that happens often in any standard. You know, there's always changes and, and feedback. And so it was, it was a very good conversation. We are definitely looking forward to speaking with him more. Um, so that really and truly, that was a good chunk of the meat for today. Um, I'd like to remind um, 
everyone on the call um, I did keep the advertising guidelines and examples in there it's not if your screen is behind it's not, you've seen this already it's um, just the California notice which would be something that could be developed very easily for Vermont um, and and using you know Massachusetts as a guideline and that is one way for us to to consider that and then also the NACV advertise, advertising checklist so that if someone is developing you know advertising logos or anything else of that fashion that it is um, they have something to go by to say did I do this did I do that um, I find checklists are helpful um, all the way around in especially in highly regulated markets and there'll be something very similar of course for the uh, packaging CCB regulators uh, I mean uh, the staff who, who are evaluating yes. uh, correctness of advertising and packaging something similar that they can use to check their uh, you know what they're seeing and about I think we're going to try to make this one pager not not by not by shrinking it down but just uh, making it a little bit simple yeah agreed um, and it will also depend on the required information but definitely sim simplicity is always good um, but it also needs to follow what the requirements are I, I again I, I always like to go by if I know the rules I can follow the rules so from there um, you know I had just kept in the enacted language uh, for the safety warning uh, flyer that would be available safety information flyer at point of sale um, and then next steps will actually um, will curtail that but what I will say is Mark and I can put together some draft language um, based on what we've discussed today that we can re present to the team on Monday and um, just draft a few different things and see what you and the other subcommittee members think so we give you something to react to you're going to hear me say that a lot um, I, I think that's just so helpful and um, so I'm not going to go through everything on here because these next step tasks will be stuff that Mark and I will take away and bring back to you as well um, so Ingrid before I move to public comments is there anything else you'd like to add today um, to, to our discussion I think I'm good for now thank you thank you so from there um, mark if there's nothing else you want to add we can move to if there are any comments from members of the public I think you and I have some homework yep excellent all right so um, Nellie and Julie do we have public comments uh, we do um, if you want to come right up here you can Hi, Danica. Hi, Gina. It's Bernie from Vermont Garden Association. Got the mask on. Did you say it? It's, oh, Bernie? Yep. Gotcha. Hi, Thank everybody. you so much. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, I wasn't here for the meeting last week, but has this uh, subcommittee discussed uh, dispensing of oil concentrates in vapor cartridges as it pertains to Act 164? Uh, when Bill S-54 passed, basically, solid con uh, oil concentrates can only be sold to the public in vapor cartridges um, as both a consumer and you know, formerly a producer this is very like worrisome to me um, you know there's no real help the FDA is against the use of THC in vapor cartridges especially as it pertains to safety and youths um, access to youths you're basically making con cannabis concentrates the most accessible to youths by only doing that. Um, as an aside from the fact that <clears throat> that compounded with a 60% THC cap on concentrates sort of removes a lot of processing capabilities for smaller businesses who want to enter from the ground up. I just think that it's, um, you know, the, it, the, the THC cartridge issue kind of overlaps with a lot of topics. The one here is public health and access to illicit items by those who we're not targeting to sell these to. Number two would be the environmental concerns of the only way a Vermonter can purchase is through that cartridge, which is disposable. So you're talking about throwing out heavy metals and plastics every time someone wants to consume it. And thirdly, going back to the public health aspect, 
Most distillate cartridges in the United States, whether white market or black market, are done through a process of short path or long path distillation. That's a compound distillation of either CBD compounds or THC compounds, which are then mixed with flavor for vaporizing. That process is deemed successful when you reach the highest levels of concentration of that product because you've eliminated all other additives or all other um, undesirables, whether those are terpenes, other compounds, plant matter, pesticides, etc. So currently, with this 60% law, a producer, as it's written, the producer wouldn't even be able to make the 90 per 90 plus percent THC product to then dilute for public consumption. Currently, solventless processing doesn't come in at above 60% THC, like a more artisan pr process, which you know someone can build a lab for 10 to 20 thousand dollars from to move from the ground upwards. You know that's basically banned. Hydrocarbon extraction is currently banned, which is another form of artisan extracting. Right now. Basically, the entire industry is being geared toward using vape cartridges and CO2 extraction, which is extremely expensive and basically locks everyone out of the industry except for the existing dispensaries that already have that equipment. Um, as far as the THC caps and the vapor cartridges go, I think it's irresponsible to only have vapor cartridges as, as the method of dispensing oils. And simultaneously, I think that the public consumers and producers would be better served with a list of products that um, cannabis producers cannot use as dilutants or as additives to their products rather than a THC cap. So yeah, um, in terms of Vermont itself, our community, um, you know, businesses in Vermont, Vermont has a burgeoning glass blowing community, whether non-functional or functional. A lot of artists both work in both industries. And by forcing the use of cartridges only, you're basically rendering the products of these local artists uh, useless. And these products can range from $50 for a pipe to, you know, in recent years, $50,000 for a functional hash rig. Right, uh, which is what they call basically a bong for concentrates. Um, you know, I, I just hope that you guys take this information in, and as you continue this discussion, since no, nothing is going to be decided on today, that you consider THC cartridges as packaging, and you know, hopefully remove them or you know, not ban them, but not make them the only method of, of providing oil to the public because that's wholly irresponsible. Um, the CDC, like if you go onto the CDC website, there are all these statistics about, you know, illicit vapes and whatnot, but the reality is people were dilute, the vapor cartridges themselves contain heavy metals, so they shouldn't be vaped. They're an environmental hazard, and when you cap THC at 60%, you're basically either not allowing producers to put mar product on the market, which all other states have. No other state has this THC cap, by the way. And uh, you're basically removing a ton of different uh, varieties of products that would attract out of state staters to Vermont. You know, Maine doesn't have this ruling. Massachusetts doesn't have this ruling. New York doesn't have this ruling in their bill that they just passed, even though that's a subject to change. No other state has this kind of ruling. So if we're going to go with what works across the board, um, I just hope we don't go with this. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Hey, Bernie, uh, if I could just ask, uh, maybe I'm the only one who didn't hear it, but I couldn't get your last name. Oh, it's Silva, S-I-L-V-A. I'm with, I'm a oh. policy director of Vermont Growers Association. And I have previous experience working in Maine and Colorado, uh, both you know, in processing, cultivation, under companies, and I owned my own company in Maine before I moved back when the Senate passed that bill and it scared me. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bernie. Other public comment? There's no other public comment today. 
Well, thank you, everyone. Um, we do have a little bit of homework to do between now and Monday. Ingrid, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Bernie, for your comments. Um, with that being said, if there's no additional information, um, we can close out this meeting. Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thank have a great Gina. day, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Gina. This meeting is no longer being...